Greetings again today in that name that's above every name. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good to see you today here at Northside. We welcome everyone. We welcome any visitor. We have visiting with us today. Always delighted to have visitors in the audience. And we appreciate your presence. To you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour. That's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the coming hour that we can be an inspiration to you. And if you'll call someone on the phone, you in the radio listening audience, have them to tune in and get this hour coming up, then we can be a blessing to them, especially some shut in. So I trust you do that even now. Take your Bibles and turn, would you please, the first epistle of John. And it's page 1321 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. The first epistle of John. Now, for the, for the sake of the radio listening audience, I want to say that we do tape or record the Sunday morning messages. They're available on cassette tape, the singing as well as the message. We send them out for a gift of $5 or more to help pay for radio time and expense. If you get as many as 10, they'd be $4 each. If you get as many as 20 or more, be $3 each. And we'd like for you to pray for us and write to us. We are having a struggle financially in our radio ministry. These hot summer days and vacationing time really hits us hard trying to stay on there by faith. I've been making mention of a little book. The title of it is The Christian and War. And it gives you a lot of good, wonderful information pertaining to a Christian in war. Is human government ordained of God? You'll find an answer. Does God ever take life? Is all killing murder? Does God ever authorize human government to take life? Should nations ever declare war? Does God enjoy war? Did Christ teach anything about war? And then shall, shall a Christian obey human government, or governors rather? Shall a Christian always obey human government? Can a man, man scripturally be a conscious subjector? Now listen to that one again. Can a man scripturally be a conscious subjector? Shall a Christian go to war? Is our hope a warless world? And all that information is found in this little book. I'll send the book to you if you're right in and support this ministry and request the book. Just say, Preach Edward, send me the book about the Christian and war you're sending out at the present time. And if you'd like to have a brochure on a proposed Holy Land trip, you might request it. We'll send you a brochure. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. Now a word to the wise is sufficient. I know many people say, well, Preach Edwards is on today. He's been on almost 35 years daily. He'll be on tomorrow. He'll be on next week. Well, don't be too sure about that. It takes uh, money to pay radio bills. And we go from week to week and trust God from week to week to keep us on the air. And I believe with all my heart, if you just had some idea of what the Sunday morning broadcast, as well as a daily broadcast at 12 o'clock noon Monday through Saturday, does to help a lot of dear people, even in convalescent homes, in uh, prisons, uh, people in distress and perplexed, and people that are in trouble and people that need help, you'd be surprised how this helps them. One of our dear ladies that works in a convalescent home said a dear elderly lady, the other day out there in the home just started calling my name, just right out her uh, blue sky, so to speak. I uh, probably never met the dear lady and just began to call my name and call for me. Now, she had heard me on the radio and my name was impressed upon her heart. And maybe for a long period of time, she had listened to the radio program and it meant a lot to her. The lady called me in another town last night, called my wife and said, just wanted to call and check on you, see how you're doing, see if Preach Edwards is all right. Said, I dreamed about him three times this week. I wonder if he's all right. Well, now what I'm trying to say is the radio ministry has a great impact and impression upon our people, and it's a blessing. 
And it'd be one of the greatest losses to this church could come to us if we had to lose our daily radio ministry and Sunday morning broadcast. And I hope we won't. And I believe a word to the wise is sufficient. And if I don't uh, tell you about it and keep you up to date and let you know about these things, then I feel like I wouldn't be doing my part in that respect. So you pray for me and write to me. I'm talking especially to you out in the radio listening audience that benefit spiritually from this ministry in the, through the week and on Sunday morning as well. Now if you have your Bible, turn with you please to the first epistle of John. I begin reading with verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon in our hands of a handle of the word of life. For the life was manifested, we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which you have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we made him a liar and his word is not in us. I want to speak to you this morning on this line of thought. The six sins of saints that satisfy Satan. There are six outstanding sins that's committed by saved people that really satisfy the devil. I'm going to tell you what they are and what we need to know about it. Sin number one is the sin of half-heartedness. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 14 and verse 10, Cursed be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully, and cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. That word deceitfully there means half-heartedly. Cursed is that man that does the work of God in just a half-hearted way. Now in serving the Lord, we must put our heart in it. We must put our soul in serving God and not just do it in a haphazard kind of a way, but do it because we love the Lord, because we want to be used of God and do something for the Lord and not just drift along, just to hit or miss and never aim at anything and never hit anything. And that's what he's talking about here. In the book of Exodus chapters 8, 9, and 10, you find that Moses, they have faced Pharaoh, and they are contending for the people of God that he might lead them away from the land of Egypt into the wilderness and worship God. Now God said, Moses, I want you to take my people and lead them three days journey into the wilderness and there I want you to worship me there. Moses went before Pharaoh and said, Now, Pharaoh, I want God's people to go with me to worship three days into the wilderness. Moses said to Pharaoh, They must go. And Pharaoh said, Well, Moses, I'll tell you what. If you want to worship God, just worship God right here in the land. There's no need for you to go into the wilderness, as God said. Just stay here and worship God. Now you have a lot of people today that come up with the old argument, I can serve God just as well and worship God just as well by never going to church or by staying at home or by traveling around and, and seeing the uh, handiwork of God as a cat in the house of God. You cannot do that. That is absolutely wrong. That cannot be done. You cannot worship God out of the church as good as you can with God's people on the inside. Now you can worship God. Now there's a lot of dear shut in aging people that can't go to church and they have to take second best and do the best they can otherwise. But the best way in the world to worship God is to meet in God's house with God's people at the place of worship. God designates places 
They're called local churches, and that's why we come to worship. Pharaoh said, worship in the land. Moses said, no, I won't do that. Then Pharaoh said, now don't go very far away. Just go a short way from here, and there you can worship God. See, he's trying to get Moses to compromise. And the devil will tell you as a Christian, it's all right to be saved. It's all right to be a church member. But don't, don't be fanatical about it. Don't go all the way. You don't have to go all out for God. Just kind of play along and, and you'll be all right and be sociable. And everything will be fine. The devil will tell you that. Moses said, no, we're going all the way. Now when you worship God, you need to go all the way for God. Now, Pharaoh said, don't go very far away. He's a type of the devil. And then when Moses said, no, we're going all the way. We're going three days into the wilderness. Then Pharaoh said, well, I'll tell you what. If you're going to do that, you men, just you men, go out and worship God. Leave your family at home and you men go worship God. And leave the rest of the people at home, your wife and your children. You men can take care of that. Your wives and children don't need to go to church or go all out to worship God, just you men. And the devil try to get you to leave your family at home. I remember when I first got saved, there's a man or two in the West Sea Baptist Church in the city of Greenville, South Carolina, that had a bad habit leaving their wives and family at home and they alone would come to church. I thought that wasn't, must have been the thing to do. So when I first got saved, I never missed a service. But I very seldom carried my wife or my babies at that time. I thought I was doing the right thing. I didn't know any better. They'd set a bad example until I found out that my whole family needed to be there. My wife and babies needed to be there. And I saw to it that they went to the house of God. And so he said, you men, now you men go and worship God. You don't need to take your wife. You don't need to take your children. Yes, you men will be all right. Now, that's what the devil will tell you. But your whole family needs to be in on worshiping God. They too want to be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. Do what they can for God and try to get your whole family in if you can. And then when Moses said, no, we're not going just as men. The whole family is going, wives and children. Pharaoh would type the devil and said, well, all right. Now, if you intend to go, leave your cattle and herd behind. Leave your property. If you're going to worship God, then don't take your pocketbook to church. Leave that at home. You don't need anything, just you yourselves. Be sure to leave all your money at home. Leave your pocketbook at home. Don't give anything. Don't tithe. Don't give of your gifts and offerings. Just leave all of that at home. Pharaoh said, leave your cattle behind and go on out there and worship God. Moses said, we're not going to do it. We're not going to leave one hoof, not one hoof or one calf behind. We're taking the whole business for God and we're going all out. And he took God's people and all the cattle and didn't leave one hoof behind and went out to worship God three days journey in the wilderness. Now what Pharaoh tried to do was to get him to worship God in a half-hearted way. Now if the devil can get you to worship God in a half-hearted way, you are defeated and the devil's won the victory. Now you need to realize that. Worship God, go all the way with God, get your family in, and worship the Lord. The Bible says in Revelation 3, 15, God said to the church there, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth, the little to see in church, because you're neither hot nor cold. Now, God wants us hot on fire for him, and not just to kindly warm. Now, drinking warm water will nauseate you at times, and you'll spit it out. That's what God said about the little to see in church. I'll just spit you out. You're neither hot nor cold. When you drink coffee, you want it hot. When you drink iced tea, you want it cold. You don't want your coffee cold or your tea necessarily just partly warm. God said, I want you hot or cold. Now either get in or get out, God said to the church at Laodicea. Many times we worship God with our mouths, our hearts are far away. And we can get so entwined and tied up in what we're doing to seem that we just forget about the fact that God owns us and wants us to worship Him wholeheartedly. Dwight L. Moody told the story about the governor going to a penitentiary. And there he was to pardon a number of men in the penitentiary that day. And they went down to the penitentiary. The chaplain was there. And they brought the prisoners out and they all sat down. And the chaplain got up to call the names of the men to be released that day. And they called out the name of Reuben Johnson. Said, Reuben Johnson, come forward. And you're going to be released and set free. 
Reuben Johnson had been there so long and so involved in the prison system until he sat there like he didn't hear anybody. And they said, Reuben Johnson, come forward. You're set free today. He turned and looked behind him as though they might be talking to someone else. He didn't realize they were talking to him. He couldn't believe it. And finally the chaplain pointed him out and said, Reuben Johnson, you sitting there, come here. You're free. And he finally slowly got up and came forward. He had been in that prison for many years. And they told him, they said, Reuben Johnson, you're a free man. And whenever they had selected the men to be set free, they said, the rest of the prisoners go back to your cells. And when they started back, Reuben Johnson joined them going back to the cell. They stopped them. They said, Reuben, you're a free man. You don't have to go back there. You can go home. You're free. And many times God's people get so involved in their jobs and what they're doing until they put that first and foremost in their lives and they forget about the fact that they're owned by God and God bought them and they belong to God and need to put God first in their lives and in their affairs. And so it says, now don't do the work of God half-heartedly. Cursed be the man that does that. Sin number two is the sin of being at ease in Zion. In Amos chapter 6 and verse 1 it says, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion. Now you can just sit down and take it easy and say, well, I'm not going to get too involved. I'm not going to uh, push myself into doing something for God. I'll just take it easy and just go along with the crowd more or less and never really get too much involved in God's work. Now you can do that. And God said, woe. Now that word woe means curse. Cursed is a man that's at ease in Zion. Now God doesn't want us to be at ease in Zion and be self-satisfied with doing nothing. We should never be fully satisfied with what we do for God. We need to strive to do more day by day. Now Abraham is an example. He was a son God worshiper or Syrian in the, in the care of the Chaldees. And God, through his sovereign grace, selected him out and, and told him to cross the river Euphrates. And he found a nation through him and that he did. And he crossed the river Euphrates and became a Hebrew and founded the Hebrew nation and stayed on the move for God. He was never at ease in Zion. He moved by faith. He never settled down. He's a stranger pilgrim. He looked for a city whose build is God and he died in the faith. And so there we find that, that he moved on for God. You can always look for an easy way out sometimes and it's not pleasing to the Lord. It'll cost you something to be a good soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ and don't be at ease in Zion. During World War II down in Camp Blanding, Florida, there's a train the soldiers for warfare. One day after uh, running after bivouac and much drilling and going through an obstacle course, the soldiers had to run for a certain distance and then they'd grab a rope and this rope went over a pond of water and they were to land on the other side. One by one, those soldiers, they would run so far, they would grab that rope and swing across that little pond of water on the other side. But it was a very, very hot day and some of them became wise and they wanted to cool off and they grabbed that rope and they swung out about halfway and then turned it loose and fell in the water and got cooled off and they liked that very much. But the captain in charge became wise as to what they were doing. He said, I'll fix that. So he put a big mean looking alligator in that little pond of water. Yes, you have the answer. Not a one of them fell off the rope and fell in the water anymore. It always landed over on the other side. Now they wanted to get out the easy way. They wanted to get cooled off. They didn't want to do it the army way. And, but when the alligator was placed in the water, they were glad to do it the way of the army. Now don't let God have to put an alligator in your little pond to get you to swing across. Some of you swinging halfway, dropping in the pond, taking it easy, cooling off. And God may put an alligator in there one of these days that'll grab you when you fall in next time. So remember, keep moving on for God and not be at ease in Zion. Sin number three is a sin of murmuring and complaining. Now we're all guilty of that. We murmured, murmured. I'll tell you this, uh, you'd be, uh, I guess, pathetic if you had to listen to all the murmuring and complaining this past week and the past few weeks of the heat. Now we're human beings and the heat is terrible and we all murmur about it, we complain about it. That might not be quite as bad as murmuring about spiritual things. 
We are human. We just naturally murmur about the heat. If it's too cold, we murmur about that. If it's too wet, we murmur about that. If it's too dry, we murmur about that. Now, God might look over some of these things to a certain extent, but when we begin to murmur and complain about the matter of serving God, that's where the danger is. In Numbers chapter 11 and verse 1, the Bible said when the people complain, it displeased the Lord. There the pastor was leading the church on through the wilderness and they began to complain. God got tired of it. Now when church members begin to grumble and complain and murmur about the things of God and about what's going on in the church and about uh, maybe the pastor's message and whatnot, that, that's not good. That's not pleasing to the Lord to murmur about the things of God. Now God heard them murmuring and complaining down there and they, they murmured against Moses and against the food they had to eat and because of lack of water and various other things. God got tired of it in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 10 and 11. Paul in writing the church at Corinth said, Neither murmur ye, some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them, for examples, that they are written for admonition. Now God uh, sent fiery serpents among them and destroyed a lot of them simply because they murmured too much. Now as God's people, many times we can murmur too much and complain too much about the things of God. God's been good to us and God's blessed us and we have the privilege of sitting here this morning in an air-conditioned building. Some of our backslidden church members sitting out there sweating it out at home when they could be in God's house in a good, cool, air-conditioned building enjoying the service here this morning. But they're the losers because they're sitting out there and sweating it out when they could be maybe where well, it's cool. Maybe some of them might have cool homes, some may not. And so we shouldn't complain too much about the things of God. It's not pleasing to the Lord. Now they murmured concerning the way. They didn't like the way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. He's our way. They murmured concerning the food. They got tired of that. God gave it to them. They got it free. God sent them their food every day from heaven. It would come down six days a week. They'd gather enough on, on uh, Friday to, to take them over the Sabbath on Saturday. They got all that free of charge, didn't cost them anything. And they murmured about that for 40 years. God gave them their food. A cage is send quail from the ocean and they'd catch them and eat the quail. But they murmured and complained about it. Then they complained about the old giants they had to face over there in the land of Canaan. Numbers chapter 13 verse 33, that's the great opposition. And many times God's people murmur about the opposition they have in serving God. I've been fighting hell about acres for some 40 some odd years and I, I, I'm expecting to be fighting the devil again next week and the next week and the next week. The devil never stops fighting you and every way you turn he's going to try to hinder and stop you and fight you if you're doing anything for God. They murmured about the giants. Old Goliath may meet you early in the morning or today or sometime next week but go ahead and take him on. God will help you overcome him. And then they, they murmured about their leaders in number 16.3. They didn't like Moses, didn't like Aaron, their leaders. They complained about that. It's always wrong and, and not uh, pleasing to God to murmur about your pastor, your leaders in your church. And then they murmured concerning divine judgment. They didn't like it because God sent divine judgment upon them, number 16.41. And then they murmured concerning the desert, Numbers chapter 20, verses 2 through 5. They didn't like the desert. They said it was better back in Egypt. And therefore they murmured and complained. And that can be a sin for God's people. During these hot summer days, everybody gets irritable. And it's mighty easy to fly off the handle. And mighty easy to say things and do things you wouldn't do if you were comfortable. And that's why you have to do a lot of praying and be careful. Lest you say or do something as a Christian because of the heat and things that confront you that you wouldn't do otherwise. Sin number four is a sin of judging and criticizing. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1 said, Judge not that you be not judged. Now we need to be careful about that. There was a man one time went by a neighbor's house and he was in a real hurry. He was in a trot. And he went by the house. The neighbor said, Yeah, there he goes. I said all the time that he's mad at me about something. He wouldn't even speak. Wouldn't even look my way. Wouldn't even throw up his hand. And he's one of the men in our church, and, and I know there's something wrong with him, and he must be angry. I mean, come to find out later, 
The man was running for the doctor. There was a sick child at the house and he was in a hurry to get to the doctor. They had not time to look in every direction, wave at people as, how are you doing today? And he was moving on to get to the doctor and he was misjudged. That's a man one time on a train. The train was crowded and then nighttime came and some of the men trying to get a little sleep and rest and this man had a little baby in his arms and several little children around his knees and they became fretful. That little baby began to cry and disturb everybody on the train there in their particular car. And the people became uh, disgusted and critical about it and said, I wish that man would uh, stop that baby from crying. I wish he would take that baby out of here. After a while, one man rose up and said, hey, man, said, we're trying to get some sleep here. He said, can't you take that baby to his mama? The fellow bear harmless said, I would to God I could, sir. Said the baby's mama's in the next car in a coffin. We're taking him out to bury her. Now, Miss James, a poor man, he's doing the best he could with his little children. Mother died, and he was trying to take care of them and go to bury their mother. Another man on the call there jumped up immediately and went and took that baby out of his arms and said, Sir, you get some rest and let me take care of the baby. I know exactly what you're going through. A few years ago, my wife died and left me with some little children. I had to rear them alone. I know what you're facing, sir. I'll take care of your baby. See, sometimes you can misjudge people in this respect. And that dear old man doing the best he could with that crying baby were greatly misjudged by those irritable people there on that particular train. And then number five, there's a sin of worldliness the Bible tells us about, love not the world. First John 2, 15 and 16, neither things in the world. And you've heard that many times and God's people should not, should not love this world. Did you know this world is going sports crazy? There's a man the other day paid more than $10 million for a horse. We're on a train to be a racehorse, I assume. More than $10 million for a horse. This world is absolutely gone pleasure mad and pleasure crazy. All people are talking about now is worldly pleasure, sports and things of that type. Seeking worldly pleasure. God said in the end time, are you listening? God said in the end time, people be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And that's exactly where we are today. Romans chapter 14, verses 22 and 23 said, Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which you lieth, and he that doubteth his damned if he eat, because he eateth not the faith, whatsoever is of faith is sin. What God is saying here is, Happy are you if you're not condemned about what you're doing in a worldly way. And you would not be condemned if it's pleasing to God. Then we come to sin number six, and that's a sin of neglect. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3, how shall we escape, talking about God's people, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? See, you have great salvation, a great opportunity to serve God. How are you going to escape God in the day of judgment if you neglect that? Talking about Christian people, not sinners. you got to face God in your service for Him at the judgment seat of Christ. How can you escape if you neglect that so great a salvation? You can't. You can't escape. You'll face God and give an account unto God. In James chapter 4 and verse 17, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. So if we neglect these things, if we know to do good and don't do it, we're all guilty of committing this particular sin. I know I am. I know you are. God tells us so. That's a man that went fishing one day and he loved to fish better than anything. Carried his little girl with him out in the middle of the stream and placed it on a little island, on a little sandbar there in the middle of the stream. And he got busy catching fish. He was having a time. He didn't notice the tide coming in. He didn't notice the creek rising. And while he was fishing, the water began to rise. And when he turned to look to check on his little daughter, she wasn't there. The water had risen and washed her away. And she is gone under the water downstream. That man never fished again. Never did he pick up another fishing pole. Beloved, he neglected his little daughter in trying to enjoy fishing, and she drowned. And so if we neglect these things, we can very easily get into trouble. We neglect Bible study many times, prayer, witnessing, going to church, and it's not pleasing to God. Need to be faithful in witnesses. As a man one time went to a fellow's door, knocked on the door. Young man came to the door, and he said, Sir, I'm a Christian about doing a little work in the community and want to leave your track and tell you about Jesus. 
And the man became angry, but he took the track anyway. And he went back in the house and shut the door. The, the Christian went on down the street, giving out tracts and witnessing. Next Saturday he came back by the same house. He knocked on that door. That same man came to the door. This time he had a pleasant look on his face, invited the Christian in. said, I want you to go upstairs with me for a moment. And the Christian followed this man upstairs. He said, you see that rope hanging there? You see this box here? Yes. He said, when you knocked on my door last uh, Saturday, I was just getting ready to put that noose around my neck get up on that box, kick the box over, and commit suicide and hang myself. But said, I was about ready to do that, just about ready to get on the box when you knocked on the door. When I came down, you gave me that track. Said, I read that track. It told me what to do to be saved, how God delivered me out of my problems. Said, Mr., I've given my heart to Jesus. I'm saved. I'm so glad you came last Saturday. Had you not come last Saturday, I'd be in hell today. And now I'm a born-again Christian and love God. And thank you, sir, for coming by knocking on my door and handing me that gospel track. We can be careless about witnessing, praying, reading the Bible, going to church. But we must give an account unto God for it in the day of judgment. Stand to your feet, would you please? Dear Father, I pray today that you'll take the message on the six sins that satisfy Satan and use them to help thy people. And to stir thy people in an unusual way. Help us not to be guilty of these six sins that satisfy Satan. But to glorify thee in every way possible. Use the message today we pray in Jesus name. Not only in this auditorium. But in the vast radio listen audience. We thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. Now while Debbie plays a couple of stanzas. If you're in this building and God has spoken to you. You want to join the church, come back to God, get saved, rededicate your life for any, any reason God may have spoken to you about. You may move forward at this time while David plays. Would you come? Let us help you. How about it? The door is open. The opportunity is yours. You may respond to the invitation. If God has spoken to your heart, I've delivered the message that God laid on my heart. I've done what God impressed me to do. I brought the message God wanted me to bring. You're here and you've heard it. It's up to you now to respond in the way that you should. How about it?